Hi everyone and welcome to the show. Now it's been a, a while since I've had this lovely baby out. It's a Carmen Gear, about a 64 or 65 Carmen Gear. Kind of all the practicality of a Volkswagen, but with a, a lot of style as well. Anyway, welcome to the show. We have a big one for you today. Frances Nelson QC. She's the head of the parole board and that would have to be an incredibly difficult job. And Professor Ian Plymer. Now he's the man I go to when I want to know about climate change. I don't know if you're a skeptic or you're a believer or you're a cynic or an agnostic, but I know that you'll enjoy meeting Professor Ian Plymer in the Court of Public Opinion. We've got a busy program and it's a busy week, Anzac Day and um, all sorts of things, both good news and bad news. Um, I did notice with interest that uh, Stephen Marshall, the leader of the Liberal Party, and I think we were saying the other day that between the two parties in the state of South Australia, and I guess it's the same all over the whole country, uh, except perhaps federally where the lines of demarcation and the differences are a lot easier to see, uh, we were saying that it was kind of like Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Well, this crazy, and I really do think that tax on parking spaces is plain crazy when we want to get people into the city. We're doing all sorts of things to get people into the city to shop and be part of this great city. And what do they do? They tax it. Well, Stephen Marshall has come out this week and he has said that if they get elected, they're not going to have the tax. That's a difference. I'm glad to see that he's sort of waving a flag and pointing out the difference that he could make. Mind you, election promises, we can talk a lot about all of that. In the week, we've also seen this ComSec uh, analysis of the states, you know, the state of the states. We didn't do too well. We might have a chance later in the program to have a talk about that. Uh, one of the questions we're taking out to the street is this business of population. Every once in a while it comes up. The idea of how big should Australia be? If you've got an opinion on that, uh, opinion at 44 adelaide.com.au but how big um, Dick Smith reckons it's about right in fact uh, he's of, of, of the opinion it could be smaller or fewer people and of course if you're in Sydney in a traffic jam you'd probably agree with him we've got enough people but in the week where our population it was on Tuesday night about 10 o'clock God knows how they worked that out but Tuesday night about 10 o'clock we chalked up 23 million people. We're going to go out and try and find the, uh, the popular or the public opinion on how big should this country be. More people, logically I think, produce more opportunity, more wealth and growth. The world is growing at 1.1% a year. Australia is growing at 1.7% a year, which makes us the fastest growing um, developed country in the world. Now that pleases some people and it annoys others. And we're certainly going to go and find out what people think about that. And uh, also the parole situation, Francis Nelson joins me in a couple of seconds. Are we too easy with prisoners? Do they get out too soon? Do we effectively rehabilitate them or do we send them to a university of crime where the only thing they do is get better at it? Big show! Stay with us here in the Court of Public Opinion. I pray she'd watch over me If Barbara were a queen Her servant I would be if You remember last week we had uh, Professor Byron Sharp on the show talking about brands and he promised me that he'd send me a copy of his book which he did and that's the book there and if you're a marketeer this in here is all the stuff that you don't know and they won't tell you. So it's a good book to get. And the other thing I reported last week that in its scammels at the auction, they had what I never thought I'd ever see. Uh, four packets of Amguri tea. Who would, who would think? <laughs> who would think? And a packet of Wheaties. Well, I can report to you that the Wheaties sold for $90. The pack, empty, no Wheaties in it, just the pack. A pack of Wheaties sold for $90 and the Amguri tea went for 60 
go figure. Let me introduce you to Francis Nelson QC, who is the chair of the parole board, which, as I said at the beginning of the show, has to be one of the most difficult jobs imaginable. Now, I don't know whether to call you your honour. <laughs> I'm not a judge, though. <laughs> well, you know... I've been called a lot worse, though, I can assure you. I put the gavel here to make you feel at home. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now, what's that lovely line that you have spent more time in the system than the average murderer? Absolutely true. <laughs> <laughs> How and that? no prospect of early release either. <laughs> no, no, well, you know, 30 years you've been yes, the chair. Yes, that's right. Mm. See, the thing that we in uh, the Court of Public Opinion, uh, down here, removed from your elevated court um, or judgment room, we don't know what happens in the parole system. We, we don't know whether you're too tough on them, you let them out too soon, or you're just about right. What's the process? Well, the process is that if it's a discretionary release, and they're not all, some of them are released automatically, we don't have any say in it, we have to look at whether they've addressed the factors that led to them offending in the first place. A and frankly, if it's a short sentence, um, it's unlikely that they will have done that. Mm. Uh, but we would look at psychological assessments, what programs they've done, what intervention they've done, whether they're drug free because, you know, drugs are available in prison, that sort of thing. And we would routinely interview them so that we actually can make an assessment to some extent ourselves mm. about whether that person is going to be compliant on release. So you make the best decision you can at the time. What you can't predict and what no one can predict is what might happen in the future. I if events occur suddenly that overwhelm someone, they may revert to criminal behaviour. Um, and I, I suppose you can't pick who's going to be a first-time offender for exactly those reasons. You know, human behaviour is fairly unpredictable. But using the best tools we've got, that's the basic thing we look for. Is this person at risk of reoffending? Do you, do you end up with a feeling of responsibility when somebody that you've let out on parole reoffends or of offends course. even? No, of course. When you came into the job, I don't know w what you thought. <laughs> Probably not that it would last for 30 years. Absolutely not. But do you think about parole and prisons differently now to that time when you first entered the system, so to speak? No, but I, I suspect I think about sentencing in a different way. Um, and certainly I think about prisons differently. I think we could, with resources, do a great deal better than we do. Mm. You see, turning the key on someone doesn't actually change their thinking. Uh, and it doesn't change their behaviour patterns. So I take the view, if you have them locked up as a captive audience, do something with them. Mm. Most of them are going to get out. If you don't change the offending pattern, they will do it again. Terrible balance, isn't it? Because you, you, you're punishing them, but mm. you are, in a sense, preparing them to re-enter society. Yes, and, and I suspect we don't put enough resources into preparing them to go back into the community. Um, and we should, because that's the best protection for the public. What's it cost to keep somebody in jail? Uh, it's about eighty dollars to $100,000 a head. You could put them up at the Hilton for less, probably. Probably. Isn't that amazing? It's a very expensive process. And, and that's just housing, and that doesn't take into account the cost of investigating crime mm. or putting them through the courts. Then there's the problem that uh, the prisons are a university of crime. Well... You probably learn a lot about crime that you didn't know before. Certainly we do see an escalation in criminal behaviour. Whether that's actually because someone's gone to jail and learnt um, 
mm, more serious criminal patterns. I don't know. I think within prisons they do try as best they can yeah. to segregate the more serious offenders from the younger offenders and so forth. But really our prisons are antiquated uh, and there's too much crowding in prisons. Mm. Uh, and I think our corrections department does a remarkably good job with a very small budget. When you, when somebody comes out on parole, how often does that person get back into trouble? Do you keep that, those sort of statistics? Um, we actually are so underfunded in the parole board that we don't have any capacity to uh, maintain data. Uh, and, and it would be a very useful thing for government, uh, for courts, for, for us, but we don't have that capacity. Anecdotally, uh, I think within the discretionary parole area, uh, recidivism rate is quite good. It's not as good as Canada, where they have an 80% success rate. What are we doing differently? Well, in Canada, no serious offender is released straight into the community. They have to go to what's called a halfway house. Mm. So they actually release them from the very uh, rigid structure of prison mm. to a less structured but still supervised environment. Mm. Uh, and I think that stepping down process is probably a good one. I know, you, I, I know you've got a board and it must be very, very difficult to go through all of the stuff that you have to sift through. But how often do you get it wrong? Oh, well, you know, we're always going to get it wrong occasionally. You, mm. you can't avoid that because you can't predict the future. None of us have got a crystal ball. Um, but I think our discretionary release recidivism rate is probably about 30%. Um, I, I, I know you're incredibly busy and I thank you very much for coming up uh, and having a talk to us. Are you still uh, head of the Hunt Club? Yes, yes, I have my own pack of hounds. <laughs> <laughs> there has to be life outside of parole. Yes, <laughs> because you're never going to get out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'd like to think one day, you know, um, uh, th there's a time for change and uh, uh, I wouldn't expect to go on forever. Francis Nelson, QC, thank you so much. Not at all, it's been my pleasure. In the Court of Public Opinion. Coming up with the jury, uh, we're going to be taking the uh, population question to the streets. Also, uh, does the parole system work in your mind, in your view? And a whole lot of other interesting stuff as well. Now, I could sit here and talk about climate change for a couple of hours, and uh, I, I still wouldn't scratch the, the, the sides of what really annoys me about the whole uh, argument. I, I, as you know, I don't believe that, I, let's put it this way, I believe climate is changing all the time and man has probably had some influence but a carbon tax that doesn't seem to do anything but affect our competitiveness and put an extra burden on, you can hear my voice, I'm getting angry about all of this. Let me introduce you to a man who can uh, shed a lot of logic and common sense and knowledge on this subject, Professor Ian Plymer. Thank you for having me. No, thank you. I know you're flying out almost immediately, so you've made time for us, and I'm grateful. Burning up all that fuel, putting all that plant food into the atmosphere. What a sinner I am. Well, look, that, that's one thing that really annoys me. When I see on television all of these cooling towers and smokestacks with all of this sort of evil coming out the top. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Carbon dioxide, CO, CO2, is a colourless gas, is it not? It's colourless, tasteless, you can't smell it, and that coming out from the cooling towers is actually the main greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Steam. It's oh. water vapour. Water vapour. And carbon dioxide is a trace gas. We humans are adding traces to a trace gas. The main greenhouse gas is water vapour, and I'd like to see a government have legislation to tax water vapour. Where do you think this came from, the idea of... Is it, it, is it sort of the, uh, you know, we, we, we can trade in um, uh, shares, derivatives, stocks. Uh, why not? Why not carbon? Well, it came from an anti-industrial group who 
quite rightfully say, the more industry you have, the more carbon dioxide you put into the atmosphere. And we yep. need that for making steel, for making metals, uh, for making fertiliser and to have a better life. And this has been an attack on industry because these filthy people in industry um, pollute the planet. They add huge amounts of this poisonous environmental gas to the atmosphere and we should actually tax them. The fact that it puts people out of work, the fact that it doesn't raise any money, and the fact that you can't ta touch a truckload of the material you're taxing is beyond the kin of those who have instituted this tax. But yet there are people like Tim Flannery and others, and uh, he's the Commissioner for Climate Change, is he? Yes, yes. What, a glorious what is that? Well, what is I think he goes down um, and onto his knees every day, uh, praying to that great God guy. He then... Uh, goes around for three days a week on 180,000 a year telling us that the sky is falling in, it's all our fault and if we change our ways and pay this massive tax we might just be saved if we buy these indulgences. He's an absolute disgrace. He has abandoned all of the principles of science and he has become a political lackey. Why is the government so hot on this? Is it purely the bottom line? Do they see this as a way to make money? But in Europe of course the bottom has fallen out of the, the price of carbon. And we're still, we're still talking $23, aren't we? Well, socialist Europe tried to raise money from those dreadful people that create employment, and it has failed. <laughs> the same in this country. Our socialist-minded uh, government yes. has wanted to raise taxes from the very people that employ people who pay tax, and there's a massive multiplier. One person working in a mine has a multiplier of five. Five people live off them. And they wanted to hit at the most productive part of our society in order to balance the books for money that they've already spent, which they haven't got yet. Yeah. And it won't cool the planet. It will do nothing but make us less competitive. And, and uh, industry will move offshore and go to some place where they can do more polluting than they could here. Well, it's happening already. Companies are moving to China. Um, companies from Europe are now moving to the US because of the cheaper energy, because of the shale gas revolution. In this country, costs have gone up, mm. both for the individual and for industry, and people are looking outside the country. The only people who benefit from our stupidity are our competitors. China is making solar power units as quick as it can. <laughs> China is making wind power units as quick as it can. We are subsidising sunbeams and sea breezes and helping the Chinese. Why? We should be trading with them. Yes, and you've got certain branches of the media that, uh, that go along with the mantra. You know, I, I, is it true that if you are an academic and you dare to challenge this theory, uh, that you have your tenure affected or you have your, your uh, financing or your, uh, um, your, the money that you are given for research work. Uh, this is a lever to keep you in line? Or well, I, I've been an academic for more than 40 years. I've been a full professor for 28 years in various universities. In mm. the last 15 years, I've been talking about matters climate. I would never win a research grant from the Australian Research Council. Because simply of your because, attitude? No, simply because I don't wind the words climate into my research grant applications. Now, years ago, it was a war on cancer, and if you had something to do with cancer in your applications, you might have got funded. Now it's climate. I've had enormous hostility in my life in universities from those who uh, live off the fat, those who've got their hand out from the public, and those who are frightening us witless, which the media absolutely love, because scare stories sell. Good news doesn't. And the good news is we live longer, we eat better, and we have a much better life now than we did 200 years ago. And why is that? That's due to coal, which drove an industrial revolution and created a middle class. It gave people wealth. It gave people stability. It gave people fertilisers so we could feed ourselves. Yes. And it also gave us cheap energy. So we had a definite advantage. We had cheap energy and we have a lot of energy compacted into a small volume and that's coal. And when you have cheap energy you have high employment. Where's it all going to go Professor? Uh, eventually are these people going to win and close down industry and we'll get to go back and, and live a peasant life or what do we do? <laughs> well I don't see them foraging off the forest floor. No. For example Tim Flannery <laughs> is telling us about an eight metre sea level rise yet he has a place at water level at the waterfront uh -huh. just north of Sydney and he bought the place next door only a short time ago so <laughs> hypocrisy might be the word that comes to your mind I've got some more savage words. <laughs>
Um, so people are living off the fat of this and a whole bureaucracy, universities, research groups and media groups have made their reputation on this. Yeah. Now the bad news is I think we have to wait till they die before we get onto the next fad that's likely to send us broke. Yes. I, I, by the way, I, I bought your book about getting expelled and, and some nice person borrowed it. You know how people borrow books and you never see them again. How's it going? Well, uh, this book, How to Get Expelled from School, was a, a brief discussion of climate with 101 questions that kids ask their school teachers to ascertain whether they're receiving propaganda or a good education. Yeah. The Teachers Federation had conniptions. The federal government spent half a million <laughs> of your money yeah. setting up a website attacking me and trying to answer the questions. And I give them about 25 out of 100 for their answers. <laughs> they claim questions are misleading. Well, answers are misleading, not questions. And I'm very pleased your book's been stolen because that happens a lot. And that means yes. you have to go out and buy another one. And in fact, I'm, I'm leaving the country today to go to Prague for the launch of the Czech version of this book, which had a forward by the president of the Czech Republic, uh, mm. Dr. Václav Klaus. Mm. That book has sold very well. The previous book, Heaven and Earth, which was a very dense scientific book on climate, was an international bestseller. It came out just at the right time. Various people read it and changed their mind. Why? Because I look at evidence and I don't look at models. And science has been corrupted because people have used mathematical models sitting in basements, grinding away at a computer, and they tell us the world's going to end. Other scientists, like myself, are outdoors collecting data and we see that what we measure today is no different from what we've seen in the past and it's business as usual. The planet is very healthy. Let's get on to something else. Bless you. I, 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 I think we all need to hear your message just to get some balance into it. Professor Ian Plymer, enjoy your trip overseas. Now hurry back and keep safe. Thank you for having me. Mick the Mechanic up soon and then the jury in the Court of Public Opinion. To run her fingers through my hair Come along and be my party doll Come along and be my party doll uh, I wonder what Cordo's been rabbiting on about today. One of this is one of, yes it does need oil, Jeremy. One of this would have been one of Julia's uh, cash for clunkers. Um, bit of an old bomb. And I'd never trivialise bombing but um, disgraceful events that happened in Boston but still the civil libertarians are out in force saying that um, the sole survivor should be aware of his rights um, and it flowed to Australia good to see the ABC um, rabbiting on about uh, uh, the impact of the war in Iraq uh, that killed 35 people on the same day but didn't have the same press coverage but um, it is a, a time to reflect today's Anzac Day and um, uh, whilst I'm pleased to see uh, uh, Christopher Pine not uh, getting rid of, not airbrushing out our history um, and that we should be uh, uh, very mindful of Anzac Day and the efforts that went in. And I don't mind um, going into uh, this little uh, compartment on the, uh, on the MG and, raise, and drink a toast and raise the glass for our diggers in uh, those serving in Afghanistan and those who have gone before us. Good Anzac Day, fellas. The program that shoots the breeze, never the messenger, and we go right around Australia these days, and somebody told me we have an audited, I don't know what that means, an audited audience of four and a half million people, which I think is a, I think it's impressive, don't you? And that's out of the garage in Adelaide. That's good. St. Vincent de Paul was born this week. He died in 1660, but this was the day in 1576. Paul Hogan's film Crocodile Dundee premiered in 1986, one of the most successful movies of all time. The biggest bell in the world was unveiled in London, hangs in the clock tower in Westminster Palace. Within a few years it had become known as Big Ben. Most people think the tower is Big Ben, but it's actually the bell. The Marseillaise, the hymn of the French Revolution, um, and the national anthem of France, probably the best national anthem Really, most stirring. Anyway, anyway, if it's your birthday, wedding anniversary, special week, I hope it's a very good one. Let me introduce you to Peter Sellen, who's on the jury. How do you do? You well? <laughs> nice to be here. Yes, I am. And Karen Stevens. Hi, Jeremy. And Chrissy Esau. Hi, Jeremy. Hi. Now, uh, every once in a while, this one 
raises its head. How big should Australia be? This great continent, and this week we have notched up 23 million people. Which, if you're in Sydney, sounds a bit crowded, but if you're in Adelaide, you could say, oh, we could take another 20 million, plenty of room. What do you think, Peter? I don't know about that. I mean, we've seen uh, infrastructure issues with uh, Sydney and Melbourne, as you say, growing, uh, five and a half, nudging six million Sydney, I think, these days, and Melbourne's not far behind. And the suburbs are getting further and further and further out, and there's not the schools, there's not the hospitals, there's not the, 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 the links to, that people would have in a smaller city that make them feel comfortable where they're living. And without that sort of backup, the water supply, all these basic stuff, electricity, all that sort of thing, I think it's going to be pretty difficult. I know it's a huge continent with not much in the middle, but mm. I really, because everyone's around the edge of the, the Australia, and I think it's quite foolish to say that you know, we could easily double our, our population in the next 10, 20 years, as some are saying. Where are you going to put them? How are you going to support them? How will they survive? I, yeah. think, I, don't, I don't think it's going, to, it's going to work. Well, they're talking 40 to 45 million by the middle of the century. Karen? That's Mm. Well, where are they coming from as well? So I think I read somewhere 60% is from migration and 40% is natural rates. Yeah. So I thought that was quite an interesting um, percentage ratio. And additionally, yeah, I think about the infrastructure and how are we going to be supporting Wouldn't they all these build people? because there was the demand? You can't just sort of, you know, the old build it and they will come mm. story. But surely America is this great country uh, that it is, huge country, because people did come with all their problems and their poverty, but they, 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 they took the situation and they grew it. Mm. We don't have a problem really. I mean, we can feed 70 million. We produce enough food for 70 million already in Australia, so we export food. Um, we can build Chicago, talking of America, in yeah. the middle of Australia, because in fact, if we developed a new city, and that's been proposed in uh, Venice already by Adelaide people. Um, you create a new city in the middle of Australia around Lake Eyre, so Lake Eyre is like having the lake in Chicago, a man-made lake, and you can put a canal through to Port Augusta and the seawater will go straight there so we can create a harbour. It becomes a city, it's, it's right at the perimeter of the best hot rock technology in the world. So we've actually got energy already there. So in fact, it's not so ridiculous no, to No, but you're establish. being visionary. Yeah, I am. Well, why don't we try to be visionary <laughs> well, I don't here. know. I mean, people have talked for years about turning the rivers back and uh, making the inland of Australia a great food bowl or run the water down from Lake Argyle. Well, it's, it's really easy to get it um, using gravity alone from Port Augusta. And so that's already been proven. It can work. We've got the hot rock tin uh, technology for energy. Um, a consortium of people took this proposal to Vienna as part of the Biennale two years ago. Australia needs to wake up to the opportunity to do this and we already feed 70 million people. That is we, mm. we produce enough to feed 70 million. The population will grow by 2050 and um, we've got some of the leading experts in the world, people like Tim Horton who have talked about it, Michael Young who have talked about it, Professor Young. Um, there are a, a great group of people in Adelaide in Australia that have sent this idea. We just need to do it. Okay, we went out and this is what you think. No, I think it's good to have more people. Yeah, definitely. You don't have any, you don't have any worry about uh, sustaining that, you know, health, education, uh, infrastructure? No, I don't. As long as people get out there and do the bit, I don't think there's a problem. Because what they say is the more people, the more growth. Yep. Other people say, we can't, we, we won't be able to feed everyone. No, and there's not enough jobs to go around like there is now. Mm. And barely enough now. Exactly, and the health system needs to be improved for the people we got now. I don't believe in reducing the population, like, mm. you know, and keeping people out, no way. No. My, my opinion is that we should have more. Um, for the size of Australia, the, the land mass that we have, to have 23 million people is just, it's tiny really, isn't it? You get, you get that many people in cities, just in cities around the world, so no, my thing is, my opinion would be to have more people. Just get the infrastructure right, we should be able to cope, yeah. So, do you think we need more people in Australia? Yes, because the Australia is a very big uh, country, you know, very big and should be more people. We have to move them out into the centre though, because the cities are too crowded, surely. Well, uh, you know, I tell you something. 
maybe I can understand everything because my English is not good enough. It's perfect. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, well, that's all I know anyway. Uh, I must be more people in Australia because what I say, Australia is very big. Australia is like bigger than Europe. So you think homegrown is best grown? No, I, I, I think that it's good to have all different types of um, people come from all over the world and, you know, we, that's what makes up Australia. We are a multicultural. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I remember uh, when David Tonkin was the Premier, I'd sort of just come over from Sydney and the price of real estate was very, very much smaller than Sydney. And I said to him, look, I tell you what, I love this place. Why don't, why don't we go to Sydney with a campaign, let people know that they can buy two houses in Adelaide for the cost of one in Sydney, and, or have an investment house and another house, or a holiday house. I mean, it's, it, it, the cost of living is so much less than Sydney. I mean, we could improve, we could, we could, we could increase the population in this city. Me thinking, you know, uh, more people, more customers, more customers, more wealth, more wealth, more growth. Yeah. Um, and he looked at me for a minute and he said, yeah, it's a, it's a great idea, Jeremy, but what would we do if it worked? What do you mean? Well, we don't want to spoil the city. We don't want a whole lot of people here mucking it up, do we? So I, sh after that, never talk to him about population again. But a lot of people do feel that way. Now, Francis Nelson QC uh, was my first guest on the program today and uh, a difficult job deciding who's going to get out. Uh, on parole, uh, how does the system work? Uh, are we too easy on criminals? Are we too soft? Do we send them to university in jail and achieve absolutely nothing? Christine, what do you think? Are we too soft on crime and once, not so much crime, but criminals yeah. once they have been through the court system? Do you know, if, if um, rehabilitation I think is a really important part of getting people back into society. So I think for their first offence, yes, I believe in rehabilitation and get them back into the community as soon as possible. What I'd like to see is a tiered system where a habitual criminal or a repeat offender perhaps gets penalised for having done that twice or three times or four times. So I think I, I, I agree with being, and I don't want to use the word lenient, I agree with rehabilitating a first-time offender, I believe in penalising or, pe um, you know, leaving somebody in longer yeah. if they're a repeat criminal because they're just not getting the message and I don't want them back on the streets. Karen, the, the thing that surprised me this morning when I said, you know, does the parole system work to mm -hmm. Francis? Uh, what, what are your records? What are your statistics like? I mean, how many people on parole go back in? Mm -hmm. And she said, we don't keep those records. I would have thought it would, it would have been the proof of whether the system worked or not, but I, th I think they're sort of so thin on the ground, they, they don't gather those statistics. Well, it's interesting you said that because I did actually have a, um, I was reading something a little while ago that was reporting the statistics of re-offenders, so people that have been to prison, served their sentence and then gone straight back out into the, into the community versus um, prisoners who'd been released on parole, had that transitional um, stage going back into the community mm. with support and the reoffending rates were pretty much the same. There wasn't a lot of difference. Yes, although her point was in Canada the system works better because everyone goes to a halfway house before he or she goes ah. back into the community. I think mm. that's a much better idea. Mm. Period of adjustment. Yeah, I do. I think it's especially in the mm. light of rehabilitation mm. versus punishment mm. or deterrent. Mm. Mm. So I think that, yeah, I, think, totally I do agree. think that transition totally is agree. good. Transition is important because I'm sure if you've been out of town a while, um, the only people you're going to start mingling with are people that you've been having a community with. Mm and they're possibly yeah. offenders, so mm. it gives a chance to re-establish um, perhaps a job, perhaps family, people that are going to support you on your path back. You've got to have mm. the support, but the other thing is people are <coughs> very cynical, Peter, about the fact that, that people are not going to jail, even for armed hold-ups and things like that. They're not going to jail because, number one, it's too expensive, and number two, there's no room. Well, that's right, and then there's always the risk of people go in for a, a minor offence, shoplifting or whatever it might be, and they stay in there and they get this, the culture, they soak up this, oh, this is a good life, no, you've got caught this time, but listen to me and I'll set you straight, and uh, here's a good way of making some money, uh, set you on the path of crime. So that, that element may be in it as well, that once you're in the big house, then you're in, in the thrall of some of these hardcore people often that, that will 
you know, turn you from you know, ordinary Joe Blow mm. into with the potential to be something worse. And it's a fine line for the parole board. I mean, they don't get it right all the time. Uh, look, we had the Jill Maher episode and, and similar ones that, that people go out, yes, I'm, I'm fine now, it's all good. And the psychologists chat to them and a lot of people are very good at lying <laughs> and they can say, listen, I'm a reformed man and it's fine. Mm. Uh, but often, sadly, that's not the case and they go out and, and repeat again. And this is what you had to say. I honestly probably don't know enough about it, but I do agree with statistics need to be uh, made or delivered to say what is working. Um, too many people are probably still re-offending. Um, are they getting looked after in the prison system, educated? I honestly don't know. I'll be quite frank with you because I have nothing to do with it. I've had nothing to do with anything to do with legal side of things or anything, so I can't honestly tell you. So you don't bump into the odd re-offending crim? No, I don't. <laughs> unfortunately, That's good. <laughs> fortunately, unfortunately, I think it can be a bit tough, probably, but uh, yeah, it's probably other things can be done about it. Um, couldn't really say. I wonder how many people do re-offend after having had the experience of being in jail. After all, it could be treated as a university of crime. You go in there and you learn all the tricks. Well, some, I don't think some people just don't want to, you know, get rehabilitated. They just want to keep on doing what they're doing, and yeah. you know. So maybe, yeah, fair enough. Tougher on them and the re-offenders if they want to keep doing silly things. Well, yeah, you know what I mean. Um, well, I don't really have the knowledge to be sure about this, but I don't think locking people up does them a great deal of good either. So if the parole system is properly policed or, you know, they're properly they're given some care, I think, yeah. when they're uh, let out on parole, I think it's probably a good idea. Um, oh, I don't think they keep them long enough. We don't keep them long enough. That's right, yeah. It's a really hard one, that one, because where does it start and where does it end? You know, I mean, if you put them in jail, it's not going to solve anything. So you've got to try and do something before they get to that point, yeah. which is up maybe to the parents, the schools, people, I don't know. Well, you're perfectly right. It strikes me that the whole thing is based on putting the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff instead yeah. of the fence at the top. You know, you've got to try and stop it before it gets to the point that it does. But I think the jails are overcrowded anyhow. Um, but what do you do with these kids? See, the discipline's gone out of the home to start with and then you're not allowed to do anything at school either. Now I'm not a great one for watching sport, I don't know why, I, I just remember when I was at school they used to stand me on the quadrangle uh, hour after hour because I didn't have what they call school <laughs> spirit which meant I didn't care about the football and I didn't <laughs> care about the cricket, it was a big, a big problem. The question we are asking our jury and you is, is the media too obsessed with sport. Now I just grabbed two papers here. Uh, here's the advertiser. Front page, you know, then uh, there's the Sunday Mail and more sport. And I think yesterday, Monday, because we record on a Tuesday, Monday was uh, a basketball or a netball story. I don't know. Christine, are we um. blessed <laughs> with too much? Too little or just the right amount of sport in the media? Well, I haven't really got a sporting bone in my body. However, no. I love, um, you know, I love news about superheroes. And by that, I mean, you know, our, our wonderful golfer who's just earned his green blazer. And I was thrilled to see that on the front page. And I warmed and I wanted to see the hole in one uh, or the last hole when he won it. Um, so that's fabulous, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'd much rather hear other stories than sport, but I guess sport's always a winner because uh, there is a winner, and so it's good news, and when you put it in among so many bad news stories, maybe editors all over the country say, hey, at least 50% of the people that open this paper are mm. going to be really thrilled when they see our front page. Yeah, but you don't think it's part of the dumbing down of the media? You know, cake and circuses. I think, I think it's a dumbing down of the community because I think we, um, the young people, read less and less, so they just want to know what the score was. And pretty I, pictures. I was at the football on Sunday, and people left before the outcome. They didn't really need the score; they just knew that the Crows had won. 
mm. um, clearly won. So they weren't there for the sport, they were there for the result and the feel good, and they were out the door to get their meat pie. Yeah. So I don't know, you know, maybe it's, um, maybe the newspaper sees it as being the only way they can sell mm. at the moment. Well, that's somebody's mm. telling them that you've got to get a younger audience and a you younger audience, and that's one way to do it, Karen, yeah. is yeah. to put sport on the front page. Well, maybe. it's cultural, as you were yeah. just, uh, just saying. Then basically it's cultural, so it's a reflection of Australian society as a culture. Mm. We're a sporting society, it's what we love. Newspapers are there to sell. They're, I would imagine that they're putting things in the newspaper that they are expecting people want to see and want to read. Mm. I find it boring. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't mind having the sport on the front page if it's a momentous thing like the golfer. That's just yeah. fantastic. One out of the box. The guys never, you know, we've never won yeah. that before. Or winning America's, America's Cup. On, on, Absolutely. Oh, that's, oh, that's, a, that's a historic event. Yeah. But when you have footballers on the front page of the paper for the last couple of weeks, for example, when the season started, his family, the, you know, what he had for breakfast and uh, you know, how he's feeling, what's you know, the, 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 the mood the, around the, the club, that could be on the back page. And I'm mm. saying uh, a lot of editors think that everyone's sport mad, and, and that is not the case. And I've even read letters to the editor saying, you know, you know, guys, there's more important things from, I'm a diehard mm. sport fan, golf, whatever it might be. But here's an example in the electronic mm. media, when Kuwait was invaded by Iraq all those years ago, <clears throat> it was a weekend, and I said to the producer, so we're leading with the, oh no, Port Adelaide might get into the AFL, a big, big story, spec piece, oh, everyone wants to know. I said, but hang on, uh, this, this is quite a big event happening. So we went for six minutes mm. on will they, won't they, might they, should they. Mm. And I said, OK. And then we went into the war, the Kuwait on fire. And I said, uh, what's happening tomorrow? Oh, we'll talk about that tomorrow. And tomorrow we had an even longer spec piece about Port Adelaide and segue to mm. the war. I said, what are you thinking? Surely even the most hardened sports nut would want to know something that's going to affect their lives. Their Maybe lives. the Middle East, the yes. oil supply has gone up as well. But I don't mean to be cynical, <laughs> but uh, apart from this ever growing gambling industry that has infiltrated sport and it's it sport generally is a huge industry mm. Mm. and it employs a lot of people but the media actually buy the rights mm -hmm. you know I think the, mm. the networks will bid up to a billion dollars mm. mm. for the rights so obviously they're going to talk it up mm. and they're going to promote it and they're going to put an awful lot of uh, promo effort into it. Mm. I mean, it's nice to see them. It's a good thing that people enjoy their sport. It's a good activity and whatever. But if you're not interested, then perhaps it has the negative effect of you won't buy the paper. And I just got sick to death mm. of seeing mm. you know, lovely mm. stories, but yeah, yeah. no relevance to me nothing, whatsoever, nothing to and perhaps to you. Mm. Karen? Anyway, I was a bit nervous taking you to the street. <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet you were. <laughs> you could have got lynched, but this is what happened. Well, I think there's way too much sport on TV, quite frankly. Yeah, every time you turn the TV on, it's just sport, every channel. Mm. And if you're not into sport, what else is there to watch? Hmm. No, just stuff I enjoy. Mm -hmm. On free to air, you're talking about? Yeah, well, generally across the board. Oh, no, I, yeah, probably enough for me on the weekends anyway. Right. I'm a sports fan, but I think there probably is, yeah. I yeah. mean, when you have a look at the amount of column inches that get devoted to some events where there's less than 2,000 people going along, yes. um, it does make you wonder, yeah. It doesn't bother me, it's just that um, what, gets, what, what, what upsets me is that every, time you turn, every time you turn on a sports news or on the news, there's always some sportsman in trouble. <laughs> they can't keep out of trouble. <laughs> yes, there is definitely too much sport and there's too much AFL. Takes over the media. Yeah. Why do, you th why do you think it is that it's taking over the media? All we're hearing about is their, their drugs. We're hearing about every time a footballer goes wrong, every time a footballer drinks the wrong thing or he goes out partying and he dies or he has an accident or something. But they're not talking. The Anzacs aren't getting as much coverage as they get. Yeah. When there's things that happen in real life in the world, we, everybody just wants to know about the football and they don't want to know about reality in real life. Well, I wonder whether there's an issue here about the amount of space they devote to various things and whether they're related to people's priorities. Like, for instance, what do most of us talk about? Health, relationships, all that sort of stuff. You don't see any of that in the paper. What do you see? You see page after page of politics, page after page of sport, and a little bit of business. Now, the people I talk to, that's not their preoccupations. Yes. So one does wonder who they're talking to and where they're getting their advice. Yeah, and whether they're trying to make an agenda rather than respond to what people actually want. I probably uh, shouldn't say this, but uh, uh, when I was with 5DM, um, one of the, 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 the jobs we were looking at, uh, one of the jobs I had to do was uh, get the SANFL uh, to uh, 
let us cover the sport. And they said, well, how much do you bid uh, for covering the football? And I said, oh, no, 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 you've got it wrong. I mean, we make you famous, mm. so you pay us. I can't really remember whether we got the gig. <laughs> but, you know, where would sport be without the media pumping it up? You know? Exactly, mm. absolutely. Yeah. And there's cancer cure on page seven and the mm. AFL that on page one. That would be an extreme example, but that could happen. <laughs> <laughs> that could happen. Peter, good to see you. Thank you for having me. No, thank you, Karen. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. Chrissy. Great to see you. You're Jeremy. a wonderful jury. <laughs> ah, always. Thank <laughs> you. Coming up, Betty Samus. <laughs> Really nice pet of the week coming up a little bit later on and Betty and her entertainment segment. But uh, this week, do you remember Smokey Dawson? Smokey Dawson's horse. I wonder if anyone knows the name of the horse. I bet somebody out there does. It was Flash. He was 35 years old, Flash was, when he died uh, this week in 1982. Pizza Hut opened their first store in Australia at Belfield in New South Wales, and the rest is history. Um, oh, and th I must do this one. Sir Frederick Royce died at the age of 70 in 1933. The Rolls-Royce automobile manufacturer joined with Charles Rolls in 1906 to form the Rolls-Royce company, of which there are a couple of examples in this very garage. Beautiful old things. Now, <laughs> I can't segue <laughs> into Betty <laughs> that way. I'm Can glad I? I'll make you no, laugh not, that much, Jeremy. <laughs> you're not a beautiful old thing. You're but, a beautiful young right. thing. Right. Yes, yes. Thank yes, you yes. very much. You yes. put me in a great mood now. Yes, you're I, laughing at me. No, no, no. I was going to talk about heavy petting and <laughs> the whole thing got out of control. <laughs> right. I can see where your mind is at. That's fabulous. Ah, uh, yes. Are we Look, actually continuing with it? Yes. Oh, fabulous. Okay. You, Let's leave you it wanna, in. You want to stop me in mid-track? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I do stop people mid-track. I my apologies. I apologize. Okay. Now, what yes. have you been doing this week, Betty? <laughs> well, my girlfriend Paula McManus. Yes. Is an amazing photographer and she writes for Weekend Notes and she sent me these uh, pictures of a trip she had taken, like a little day trip to the beautiful Adelaide Zoo. Do you know how old the Adelaide Zoo is? No. 130 years old. And it is a beautiful zoo because it's right in the city. Absolutely. And, you know, financially, I think probably going through reasonably tough times. That's right. Mm. Do you remember Greater, the flamingo? who was bashed a few years ago. Oh, yes, ago. I do, yes. And he was found, he, wouldn't, he, he, he just couldn't breathe and he couldn't walk and he had these awful injuries. Well, he did recover yeah. and he lost sight in one eye. But, well, the sad thing is, is that the zoo has uh, announced recently that Greater is not expected to live for much longer. He's very old and suffering uh, mm. terribly from arthritis. There's zoo volunteers uh, on Flamingo Watch all day to monitor his condition. He's been with the Adelaide Zoo since yeah. 1930. And he was probably trusting, you know, he, he would never have had any violence perpetrated mm. upon him. Mm. And then out of the blue, somebody beats him up. It's awful. And yeah. this winter may be his last, but he, um, he is the oldest living flamingo in the world. He's only one of two flamingos in Australia, and they are both mm. at the Adelaide Zoo. And, you know, their numbers are dwindling, and it doesn't look like any zoo is going to bring any more into Australia. So it is quite sad. So they're not exactly a breeding pair. No. <laughs> they don't know whether greater is male or female. No. Well, it is a bit hard to tell under all those feathers. So that's right. Well, you can see the beautiful images that <laughs> yeah. have been on the screen. Yeah. And thank you, Paula, very much for supplying those images to us. Good. Now, the Shorts Film Festival opens the this weekend. Yes. This was started by David Lightfoot, who was a producer um, for Wolf Creek. And he wanted a film festival that would showcase short films and just give filmmakers a bit of an avenue mm. to showcase their work. And, you know, the films are judged and they're celebrated on the ability to communicate a story. 
Um, so it's a, you haven't been to the Shorts Film Festival, have you? No, I saw um, a bit of one in Sydney, yeah. which, which is sort of the top fest thing. That's which, right. Which grew out of a cafe and has become That's a right. huge. Well, this this has become huge too because it's like a lounge style setting. Mm. You can actually buy food, sit down, have a drink, and look. I don't like watching long movies. You know, I get quite no. bored. Well, these are only seven minutes or That's something. That's right. Yeah. So you get to watch like half a dozen movies in a night. You get to talk with other people yes. about what you think of them. They get judged. But recently they've joined... It's like speed dating. <laughs> <laughs> Speed film dating, that's you right. You should have seen her eyes light up. <laughs> she knows been, what I'm talking no, about. No, I've never been. No, well, no Would you I. take me Speed dating? Seeing you know so much about it. Oh, no. <laughs> I think one needs to take one's time. That's yeah. right. Anyway, we'll get back to the Shorts Film Festival. Yes, right Now, Soho Rushes Film Festival. Mm. They've joined forces with the Adelaide Film Festival. They give us 12 of their fabulous films for us to showcase. Yes. And we give them 12 of our films to showcase. How wonderful is that? Yeah. I do, are we better off or are they better off? We are both better off. Okay. And uh, what, what, what's the hit of the show? The hit of the show, I don't know. But you know Theo Maris' son won it last year. Uh, well, he's now doing very well in America. So these things can happen. You never know where it can lead to. Yep. So we uh, must go. Miracle on King William Street. Crew, do you want to go to the Shorts Film Festival? We're in. You're well, in one of the entries. Why did you keep that quiet from me? I never keep anything from you. Well, it was just one of those things I was cast, uh, like many things. <laughs> cast? Uh, cast, right. uh, because I was around. <laughs> and I, I work very cheap. So okay. So they, they, they put me in and they, I played a radio announcer. And it's a thing called Chicken Karma. Is that the one? <laughs> right. Is it called Chicken Karma? <laughs> it is. Thank you, executive so that's producer. The one. Well, and, and Saxon played the part of the <coughs> terrorist uh, who was trying to set the chickens free. Right. And in fairness, I used to talk on the air about caged hens. And, and when is this film on? Sunday night? Um, I don't know. Sunday night? Yes. I think we should get a group together and go on Sunday night. Okay. I'd love to see you on the big screen. Chicken karma. Chicken karma. Muck, muck. Okay. <laughs> now... <laughs> I know you love leading ladies. Yes. It, your chance to get out close and personal with Marina Pryor. She oh. is coming to Adelaide. She is here, believe it or not, you know the Regal Theatre on Kensington Road is just up oh, the yes. road. Yes. And she started busking with a guitar in Melbourne. That's how she started her career. And then, of course, rose to stardom as Christine in Phantom of the Opera. She's had over 20 lead roles. Mm. Uh, Les Mis, Cats, Guys and Dolls, Mary Poppins, and you get your gun. Extremely beautiful. You can see yes. the images now on the screen. Voice. Wonderful yes, she voice. is. So she'll perform songs from female performers of the 70s and 80s, Wendy Matthews, musical theatre numbers as well and it's a cabaret style seating as well i think cabaret has proven to be a real winner yes everyone is loving it they can sit down there's candles on the table lovely so she received awards four more mo awards and green room awards and an advanced australia award for her contribution to performing art performing arts I'm so tongue-tied this evening no and what's the date for that the date she'll be here at the end of may Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll 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 work something up. You know, the Rolls Royce goes to get the Rolls Voice. That, that sounds great. How about that? That's fabulous. Now we've got to go because we've got to fit in our pet of the week. Can I just say one more petting. thing? Can yes. I just congratulate Daniel Cook, Adelaide boy from Gawler, has just scored the role uh, in London of Jean Valjean in Les Mis. Jean Valjean. And unfortunately, can't do the Adelaide Cabaret Festival this year because of that. But congratulations. Well, if he knew you were here, he would be here. Ah. Uh, over the, a role in London, I don't know. Mm. But one more thing, next week we have Scott Russell Hill, psychic to Diana. Should be great. Okay, thank you, Betty. <laughs> now, the pet of the week, I have my pet of the week. Uh, Bo, <whistles> Bo, uh, maybe, uh, uh, Sax, maybe you could bring her in. But the pet of the week, the Animal Welfare League pet of the week, now this is Codger. Codger does not actually have a loving home. So we're going to try and find one for Codger. Um, I'm the Animal Welfare League Pet of the Week. I'm a laid-back seven-year-old male. Uh, Bo, this should interest you. German Shepherd Cross. Although I am a relaxed chap, I'm very... Oops! <laughs> oh, you're so boisterous. Now listen, just stay there for a second.
Um, although I'm a relaxed chap, I'm very clever and would respond extremely well to training. I'm a dog who likes regular exercise and would like to live in a healthy lifestyle with active owners, desexed, microchipped, vaccinated, health checked, and $310. Come and see me at the Animal Welfare League 1 to 19 Cormac Road at Wingfield. Now, isn't she pretty? This is a. I don't know how you describe it. <laughs> she is a long legged Jack Russell, of which there are very few. <laughs> but she's adorable. Now, that's the show. Thank you to our sponsors. Um, thank you to our crew. Uh, and most importantly, thank you. And if we happen to sort of see you in the street and ask you a question in the court of public opinion. Thank you for stopping and thank you for your honesty. <laughs> Never perform with adults, children or pets. <laughs> Believe in yourself. I'm Jeremy Cordo. See you next week. Bye for now.